am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Jesus, praise God. Oh, my, my, my. If y'all want to sit down just a minute, you can. Praise God. I was, uh, Brother Terry, I, I was thinking about God's refrigerator this morning. <laughs> and sure enough, I saw it. My picture was right there. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Oh, my. And, uh, well, you know, some of us be a rough picture, wouldn't it? Every time God walked through his kitchen, he'd say, ooh. Amen. Well, let me share with you a card from Sister Karen Powell. Dear church family, thank you so much for the outpouring of love that was shown to me and my family. Uh, Pastor Douglas, Pastor Schwartz, thank you so much for reading of the scriptures. It was a wonderful tribute and a celebration of my mother's homegoing uh, church. I appreciate y'all. So grateful for you. Sister Karen Powell, and we're just so delighted that Sister Karen Powell has been an active participant in the family of God for right here at the church at Asheville. Sister, she was here when it wasn't even called the church at Asheville. 
Amen. How long has it been, Sister Carol? It's been 20, yeah, close. You're guessing, and I am too. Years. It's been a while. Been it's a been a while. And we've been so blessed to have so. We were at the home going service just a few days back, and, and I looked around that little church down in Cullaway, and uh, what was amazing about it was. I believe about half of her family has been to church here at one time or another. Now, the problem was that some of the kids that have been to church here kept growing, <laughs> and uh, they were grown-ups, and I'm looking, and I said, I think I know, I think I know them. But, uh, uh, and sure enough, they'd look at me, and they'd smile, and they'd come over, Brother Douglas, good to see you, and uh, it was just so wonderful, but Sister Sister Karen has had such an impact upon her family yes, and uh, upon her loved ones in, 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 in encouraging them in their walk with God. Amen. Praise God. So we are certainly so appreciative. And her, her precious mother, uh, she had her home church, but when she came to visit, she was always here. She never did come to Asheville to visit her daughter without coming to her daughter's church. Amen. Amen. And she was so, so precious. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, let me have some ushers. Y'all look around. Find some money. Check your pockets. See if there's a check in your pockets. We're glad to have Tom all the way back from the nation's capital. Amen. Praise God. There, I heard there was... There was riots going on up there while he was there. I don't know if he was involved or not, but we'll talk about that later. Amen. Let's pray. Precious Lord God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Lord, for every blessing, for every way that you've kept your hand upon us, Lord God, or you've met our needs. Uh, and Lord Jesus, we're returning a portion of our gain to the work of God that your will might be done in not only in us, but in others as well. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Light of the world, you came down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that makes this heart a gold. Hope of a life spent with me.
Jesus. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And here I am to worship. Here I wonderful Lord you are wonderful you are lovely Lord Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus uh, we invite all these young folks to go to the fellowship hall with uh, sister Douglas and those that are assisting her this morning thank you Jesus and for those of us who are alive and remain thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sweet spirit in this house, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It has been a strange day of distraction. And what I mean by that is, is there are some days that you... you you come in to whatever it is that you're about to put your hands to do or your heart to do, and you have this wonderful sense of direction and purpose. Those are the best days at work, man. When you, when you know exactly what you came to do, and you get right in it, and you get involved in it, and before you know it, it's time to clock out and go home because you, you were totally engaged. Now, the, the hard times are those times when you, you're, you're, you've got things pulling and tugging at you. And maybe you start your work shift and you start working on something and somebody comes and gets you to do something else and then something else needs to be dealt with. And all of these things happen and you look at your watch and you think, good grief, it's been a busy day. And you realize it's only 8.30. And you think to yourself, Wow, <laughs> this is going to be a long Monday. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the words of the poet, Monday, Monday, can't trust that day. You know? So <clears throat> in, in seeking the Lord for this service, it was ironic to me that he brought me to the book of James chapter 1. So if you would turn with me to James chapter 1, I want to read a few verses here. Thank you, Jesus. James chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her complete work, that you would be complete and entire, not lacking anything. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Whew, he gives to all men liberally and doesn't upbraid them. Thank you, Jesus. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers 
is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that if he that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in some of his ways, in all his ways. And that is what I would like to spend a little time speaking to us about this morning is single-minded. In Jesus' name, Lord, we, we ask that your sweet presence would let our hearts be able to receive your word, that it would find good ground, Lord, because we want to be fruitful in this season. We are not unaware of the season that we live in, Lord, and we see the leaves coming out, and we see the buds, Lord Jesus, as they are bursting forth, and we understand that that means a time of growth, Lord, and we want to grow also. So we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would let your word fall on good ground. We want to be fruitful, and we want to grow in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated if you want to. Thank you, Jesus. In the Old Testament, at the end of the book of Joshua, the children of Israel are about to say goodbye to Joshua because it is time for him to study war no more. Okay? And in the book of Joshua, now they, they came out of Egypt land. The Lord brought them into the promised land after wandering for 40 years. You know, a whole different generation. Joshua's generation gets to come into the promised land. And it's powerful and it's amazing. But the work wasn't done because they had to come in and they had to subdue the land. But it was really cool because the Lord went before them and behind them. And he used some really cool ways of driving out the inhabitants of the land. Is anyone uh, familiar with murder hornets? Right? Y'all remember, I think it was a couple years ago, they were showing pictures of them, these massive murder hornets. I was sitting out next to the fire pit with Kevin uh, a weekend or two ago. And I saw something weird crawling around on the ground. So I took a picture of it and I texted it to one of my employees because she likes bugs. That's what I said, Latanya. I was like, mm mm. No. She's like, it looks like a murder hornet. I was like, what? That's terrible. I don't want to be sitting around the fire pit with a murder hornet. The Bible says that. The Lord drove out some of the inhabitants of the, of the promised land with hornets. That's crazy. Man. But so here was Joshua, and he's about to, he's about to depart. And he admonishes the children of Israel. He's like, hey, so you've been doing this thing. You've come into the promised land. The Lord has blessed you. The, the Lord has been driving out the inhabitants. And he tells them in, in chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, he says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods that your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. Isn't that weird how far back he goes? He says, put away the gods that your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The thing about these gods are, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about a carpenter who cuts down a tree, and he uses part of the tree to make a fire, 
and to bake some bread and to roast some meat. And he uses the other part of the tree to carve out an image that he then bows down to worship. And what God was saying through Isaiah was, isn't that silly that the very same thing that he was using as his sustenance that was going to be consumed, or at least changed, because I guess matter never really disappears, was the same thing that he was worshiping. <laughs> but isn't it just like us to take the very things that God has given for us to use as sustenance and for us to then make a little image out of them so that we can bow down to that? I have to remind myself that I work a job not because I'm working the job for money. Because if that's why I'm working the job for, then I'm going to work really, really hard or really, really long. I'm going to do everything I can because I'm going to try to accumulate more so that I can do more for my family and give more to others. If I get trapped in that thinking, I don't work my job for money. God takes care of my provision. Right now, he's choosing Bob Carnes Jr. to sign my paycheck. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. I love Bob. God has blessed Bob. I was telling one of our um, distributors, our, our aluminum distributor, distributor, he comes by. He's the regional manager. He's like, how's things going? You guys seem to have been really busy. We're selling y'all a lot of aluminum. Y'all are busier than ever, and a lot of folks are not busy. I said, oh, but let me tell you why. And I'm standing in the showroom, and I'm standing there. I'm like, Ted, you're not going to believe this. But when God opened up the doors for my bosses to buy Greenville Awning Company, they didn't know anything about commercial awnings. They didn't know anything. They didn't know what contractors to connect with. They didn't know that they needed engineering for every little thing. They didn't know anything. But look at this. Forrest, you've seen this in your own life, how God takes something, and you're like, Lord, if this is what you got for me, and then the Lord just sort of makes a way where there was no way. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in, in a whole additional line of business. And the Lord helped my bosses to move forward in, into a whole new aspect of, of business. And now we have all these contractors that they don't even get another bid from anyone else. They just say, hey, Jay, I'm sending you a contract. That's amazing. God is awesome, right? And I'm telling this to Ted Puckett. I, I don't mind telling you all his name. He lives in East Tennessee. He's a sweet man. Ted Puckett. He's, and he's not sure what to do with this information because it's so weird to have somebody standing there saying, God has done this amazing thing in my boss's business. Now, I have a Baptist boss and I have a Methodist boss. Okay? And they are brothers. Now, the reason that this is significant is in my own life, I have found that you Baptists, are a little bit more open than those of the Methody. Okay? I'm just saying, currently speaking. I'm not saying that was always the case. I'm just saying, generally speaking. Now, Bob comes by while I'm talking to Ted Puckett. And I said, Bob, I was just telling Ted Puckett how God has blessed this business and how he has just, just, poured out on you and Jay, just blessing us just to no end when y'all didn't know anything about what you were doing. God opened up a door and helped you to make it through and helped you to get through those hard times and putting out tens of thousands of dollars on materials before you could get paid for them and all of these things. And God has just been so good. Bob, Bob's the Methodist. He wasn't sure what to do with this. He wasn't sure. He is not John Wesley. But that's okay. 
because I had already testified for him, Terry. I'd already testified for him. I'd already told this man that God had blessed our business, and then I had told my boss, I reminded my boss, everything we have is because God was in it. I don't want to take the tree that God gave me upon which I can make my meal and turn it into a God. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I can spend as many hours a week as there are in a week at AirVent Exteriors. And they bless me because I'm the only manager there that's still hourly. David, that means they pay me for every second that I do anything. There is nothing under the salary bubble. Nothing. If I answer a phone call on the weekend... They get charged. If I respond to emails on the weekend or talk to the powder coater, they get charged and are happy to do it. Why? Because I'm amazing? No. Because God is amazing. And so God, in his amazing awesomeness, has this way of taking us from one place through to another place, but sometimes when we're in the new place, we forget how we got there. And we forget who it was exactly that made that way out of no way because now we're a stranger in a strange land. And this isn't familiar territory. And what is it that these other people are worshiping? It is very easy. D.W., you know this is the truth. We got to bring Jesus up in our workplace because there's a whole lot of people there with other gods in the workplace. And you might say, no, I work with a bunch of Christians. Are they filled with the Holy Ghost and living a clean life? Can you look at them and know that they're a Christian by the way that they live or did they have to convince you? Because there are many who call themselves Christians that serve other gods. The children of Israel were God's people. And yet, while they were in Egypt, according to Joshua, while they were in Egypt, they met some other gods during that 400 years that they thought were pretty neat. Everybody else is doing it. We're entering a time in our own lives where there is more friction. Not necessarily because you believe in Jesus, but because you believe in his word. And his word is tough. It's filled with love. It's filled with miracles. It's also filled with commandments that say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Man, that's rough. Can I love you and not listen to any of the commandments? Not according to the word of God. In fact, Jesus said there's going to be a whole mess of people that say, Lord, Lord, and I'm going to say, who that? Right? There's going to be a whole mess of people that say, oh, I knew you. And I'm going to say, depart from me because you don't know me. You did not know me at all. So I go all the way back to James, in which James is pouring out to these same 12 tribes in Israel. He's pouring out to them. He's like, I just feel like I need to tell you something here. You should count it joy when things become a struggle. Count it all joy. I am rather prone to being swayed by the way that I feel. I have this disability called my face. So that whatever I'm feeling 
is on my face. I can't hide it. I mean, I guess I could walk around with a bag over my head, but that would draw a lot of attention. I can't lie to you. You'll see it. I can't try to spare your feelings because you'll see it. And just, it's all right there, princess. I don't know what to say. It's like a big old billboard. And it, it does seem to me like there are days where I have to stop and say, the way things feel cannot dictate the rest of my day, or this is not going to be a good day. Y'all ever have those? You know, some people say, well, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I can only get out of one side of my bed. Kevin blocks the whole other half. The whole other half, man. So I got to get out on the same side every day. And if it's the wrong side, then that's going to be rough. When you come up against opposition that are making things difficult in your life, do you stop and think, is this hard because of me, because of my attitude? Is God trying to change something in me through this? Has he allowed this in my path so that I can be different on the other side of it? We, we were studying about um, the, the Passover and, and all of the things that have happened leading up to the cross. And as we wrap up the book of Mark, and man, one of the most powerful things that you see in Jesus' life is the road to the cross. And this, this leaving of Passover, having a delicious meal with his friends, imparting to them, and then they go singing a hymn and, and going off into the Mount of Olives, and they find a place to pray. And Jesus tells some of them, stay here, Peter, James, and John, I want you to come a little further with me. Now, all of us want to be Peter, James, and John, that the Lord says, come a little further with me. Right? Like, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be back there. I don't, I don't want to be back there with Thomas and Levi. Like it, that's fine for them, but I want to go into the garden with Jesus. But here's the thing. It seems to me like God chooses really kind of losers to go deep in the garden with him. I'm sorry. If y'all have been deep in the garden with Jesus, I apologize for calling you a loser. But I'm looking at who was there. Peter, James, and John. Peter, come on, loser. You know what I'm saying. I mean, he, he was a poor fisherman, which is fine. Just a lot of y'all are poor fishermen. I get that. I'm poor and I can't fish. I can't fish to save my life. Help me, Lord. James and John, they're like the sons of thunder. But again, fisher folk, they were just regular people. They were super imperfect. And Jesus said, I want you to come deeper in the garden with me. I want you to be so close to me in the garden that you can hear what I'm praying to my heavenly father. And he says, sit here and watch. And then he begins to subdue his flesh for what was coming next because in Gethsemane that just means olive press right a place of crushing you know it makes sense that they would have that at the Mount of Olives you got all these olive groves are they groves or orchards groves olive groves that they would have a place there to crush them to, to make that wonderful oil that was, that was used for all sorts of things. We use it for all sorts of things. We also use it for anointing. But you know, the olive has to be crushed to get the oil out. You see what I'm doing here? And 
Jesus, in that place, had to allow a crushing to happen in his flesh, in his spirit, really, inside of him, so that when he left that place, he would be able to walk through the things that were coming. James said, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse tests, knowing this, that that trying of your faith, it works patience, and patience, when it has its perfect work, means that you'll be complete, you'll be whole, you'll be entire. Do you know that the Bible says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. I know that this is not the kind of thing that you learn in school these days. That there is, there is difficulty between you and success. But if you live in this world long enough, you recognize there are hard things that separate you from who you are now to who you need to be and who you want to be. You can never go back to who you were even yesterday, that person is dead. Can't access that person. You are who you are right now. And in order to press forward to something else, there's going to have to be something walked through. Does that make sense? And it's not always pleasant. Sometimes it requires, in fact, I would say always it requires, a taking up of one's cross to follow Jesus. But we can count it all joy because in doing those difficult things, the Lord is bringing all of that together for our benefit and for our good. Because maybe the first time he hung my picture on his refrigerator, he thought, that is a work in progress. <laughs> you know? I mean... You know, some of you grandparents may not be willing to admit that some of your grandbabies were not beautiful when they were born. They looked like a drowned rat. But you did not say that to their mother because you are wise. Newborn babies look terrible. They look like they've been through a horrible, horrible trial because they have. But man, they change. And you are changing as you grow in the love of Christ. Now, let's address this singleness of mind, this single-minded idea. In the book of James, he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Yeah. We, I have, I struggle with multitasking. I don't struggle with doing the multitasking. I like to multitask. I like to do six things at the same time and finish none of them. Beca because I'm efficient, you know? I go and I think I'm going to put some clothes on to wash and I go and put them in the washing machine and then I go and I get distracted with something else, never hear the washer finish, never remember to put them in the dryer. Three days later, I have to wash them again because it's summertime and they soured. It's awful. Those kind of things happen. But in the book of James, he's like, you know, if you lack wisdom, you can ask, you can ask the Lord for wisdom. He wants to give to you. He won't withhold that. In fact, he will give you liberally what you ask for. When was the last time any of us asked for wisdom? When was the last time any of us said, Lord, what time do you want me to go to bed at night? <laughs> Lord, what time do you want me to be getting up in the morning? You see, uh, right now, there's a number of us that are thinking, why would I ask the Lord that? That's crazy. And yet, 
Sometimes you get up in the morning and you stagger through your day and you feel terrible because you spent no time with the Lord before you left your house or when you got to work. You didn't spend time, quiet time with the Lord. He didn't have an opportunity to speak into your life. And you think, well, I couldn't have got up any earlier. Good grief, I only got six hours of sleep as it was. Then why didn't you talk to the Lord about what time you were going to bed last night? Well, I had all these other things to do. You don't have to do the news. You don't have to do the news. You don't have to stay up and watch what they're going to say. It's not going to be that different. It's like a soap opera. You can catch up about every three months and nothing's really changed. You still got the story. Everybody's doing that fake smile like they don't know as the world turns. That's fine. There are ways that we can ask for wisdom and the Lord can direct our paths in such a way that we can have focus, single-minded, directed. The problem with being double-minded is that it makes you unstable in all of the areas of your life. When you're pulled and tugged in such... And that's what Joshua was trying to tell the children of Israel. He said, you need to go ahead and decide now who you're going to serve. Because it's not hard right now. Right now, we're experiencing victory. We have liberty. We can gather together freely. We can walk around with our Bible in our hand. We can own 16 Bibles. We can speak to people openly about Jesus. It is easy, easy to serve the Lord in the current climate that we have now, and yet it is hard because what we're battling is our flesh. It is hard for us to prioritize. It is hard for us to put God's time before the time that we have to spend with everything else. These things are, I understand what it is to have to prioritize and that it isn't easy. I don't like necessarily going to bed early and getting up early, but over the years it's become the only way that I can get the quiet time I need with the Lord. And if I have that quiet time with Him, guess what? The rest of the day goes a lot better than it would have. Not only that, but the God who stands outside time has this ability to stretch time just like he has the ability to compress time. He stretched Friday and Saturday so beautifully. He was amazing, Dad. Because normally the days are like that. And if I'm off, they're like even faster than that. You know what I'm talking about, right? You're like, ah! It was an awesome Bible class on, on Friday morning. We were just worshiping the Lord and, you know, and then I went hiking and then we cooked. And you know when I say we, anytime it has to do with cooking, I really mean Kevin. Y'all know that. We, but I was with him in spirit. I tell him repeatedly, your house smells so good. So full of good smell. And then yesterday I got to ride my motorbike for hundreds of miles. I rode all over the high country. It was amazing, Mike. I saw the Cane River, the Toe River, Jack's Creek, Rock Creek, a bunch of other rivers that I didn't know what they were called because they didn't have a sign on them. Just, and the Lord just stretched out time. It was so beautiful. Got to spend time on the porch with my parents yesterday morning, sipping coffee and talking about the Word. It was so great. God can do that in your life. If you can pull yourself away from all these distractions that say, no, attend to me first, attend to me first, attend to me first. D I, my needs need to be met first. If we can pull our mind into and say, Lord, give me wisdom about my decisions. I don't want to be tossed about. That's what it feels like. Indecisiveness, it feels like being tossed about. It feels like you can't make up your mind. 
James said, if you will ask and you will believe when you ask, that you won't be like that. That you'll be focused, you'll be single-minded, you'll be set on a course. Has anyone ever watched Robin Hood? I liked Kevin Cosner's version the best because like, he did that and then there was a scene where he, he hit the bullseye and then he did a second arrow that split the first arrow. That's amazing. Single-minded is that kind of direction. You can't be double-minded if you're an arrow. You go where the bow has sent you. The question is, is what is the bow in my life? What is it that's directing me? I'm not saying that you can't have somewhat of a good life if you just kind of acknowledge God on the perimeter. It'll probably be better than it would be. I know for a fact if you give to the Lord... He blesses you. You know? Not really any strings attached. You give to Him. He pours out on you. It's amazing. But there is something about being single-minded in your focusing upon what in the world am I here for? What is my purpose in this life? And what is it supposed to mean? I'm supposed to be a minister. All of us are supposed to be a minister to our family. We're supposed to be raising up our children in the way they should go. We're supposed to be helping our grandchildren understand what it is that God is here for and what we are here for in relation to God. We have a responsibility to our spouse. We have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters. But I forget sometimes, because of the way I feel, that maybe I need wisdom on how to accomplish all of that, and then I don't know how to accomplish any of it. Let me encourage you that he will give you the wisdom that you need. There's some young ladies this morning that want to be baptized. Do you know why? Do you know why they want to be baptized? These are not children that just arbitrarily decided one day, you know it would be neat, is going into a tank of water in front of a bunch of grown-ups. That'd be neat. Kids don't think like that. Well, some kids think like that, but... These two don't think that way. The reason that they want to be buried in baptism is because from a very early age, they have understood that in repentance, we die out to sin. And in baptism, we are buried in Christ. And when we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. And that when we do those things, we are promised the infilling of the Spirit of God. Latanya, that picture that you post uh, this weekend of Quay being baptized. <sighs> you raised him up in the way he should go. And the Bible says when you do that, that he won't depart from it. I know that it is a discouraging thing sometimes to not see that on the outside. But God is working in that young man's heart. Do not be discouraged. God is moving. You have been an example to him. He understands what baptism is. He went down in the lovely name of Jesus. The devil is a liar. And we plead the blood upon our children in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your, your children were raised in Sunday school. Your grandchildren started out in Sunday school. 
There's all of these things that have happened. There's groundwork that has been laid, but you can't see. It's okay, though. I want you to count it joy. I'm asking you to count it joy. I'm asking you that in the hard things, when you see your children going through the hard things, and you see your grandchildren going through the hard things, that you will count it joy. That you would wait on God and that you would not immediately pray blessings into their life because blessings are temporary. Don't worry about the one that can destroy your body. Worry about the one that can destroy your body and your soul. Only God is the arbiter of our soul. And so even when you see things and you think, God, you, I've prayed a thousand prayers for this child. I know. I know it's heartbreaking. I understand what it is to drive by Krispy Kreme on Sunday mornings and see my son's car and know he's not at church. And worse, on the mornings that he's not at work, that he's still not at church but there's been a foundation laid and we are continuing to lay that foundation and we are not going to be hiding in our own wisdom or lack thereof saints of God we are going to ask to the one who gives liberally Lord whatever you would have me say whatever you would have me do what time do you want me to go to bed? What time do you want me to get up? How much time do you want me to spend? Where do you want me to spend my time today, Lord? Some of you are retired, and that's awesome. It is awesome to be retired. Have you thought about asking God, God, what is it that you want me to do today? I have a home I've got to take care of, and I've got all these things, especially this time of year through November. Terry, there's never going to be the work done. There's always going to be something to do. But the question is, God, do I, is there some amount of time that I need to be setting aside to go do something else? Is there something else that I'm supposed to be doing? Is there something else I'm supposed to be spending my time on? Because it's very easy for me to get caught in these waves tossing me to and fro, just allowing life to happen to me instead of pointing in a direction and saying, wait a second, I got this that needs to be done. You know what? My neighbor just needs a, a word spoken into their life. You know what? I could start a Bible study in my, in my community. You know what? I could go and volunteer at the VRQ. You know what? There's some things that I could do. I could take a little bit of time, and I could pour out for somebody else if God would just give me the wisdom that I need so that I can have purpose and I can aim at something and be single-minded and not be drawn aside. You have made so much of a difference in people's lives even now. There are people on the other side of the world that are eating because of you. There are people on the other side of the world that are experiencing the miracles of God because of you you Jesus and so this morning as sister Douglas begins to pray I'm just gonna ask that you would pull your mind from all these extraneous things it's a it's the springtime and there's all of these winds and waves that would take us what we've got to do next who we're supposed to be meeting after church what's supposed to be happening this evening what we've got to do tomorrow but push all those things out to the perimeter and draw your mind back into this one place. And it's just you and God. It's just you and the Lord. And you just need to know what He would do in your life this morning. That the foundations He would lay here would be something that would also affect tomorrow and the day after.
We've got a number of new people that have come into our church family that need encouragement and that need fellowship and that need connection. Lord, I know you love me. I know you found me. I know you saved me and your grace will never fail me. While I'm waiting, I'm not waiting cause heaven lives in me. Lord, I know you love me, I know you found me, I know you saved me, and your grace will never fail me, and while I'm waiting, I'm not waiting, I know heaven lives. So I will sing like a wind with the sea sitting on a cloud like no prison walls could hold me. I will sing like I am free. Yes, I will sing like a man. Sing, sing on a cloud like no prison walls can hold me. I will sing like I together right now and lift our hands and hearts to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sweet spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, because though we are imperfect, Lord, you are the perfecting of us. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. In every way that we have fallen short, Lord. Oh, God, you make up all the difference. It's like in our weakness, you are made strong. Lord, there's just a few of us, but we don't have to be a lot to make a difference, Lord, if we're reaching out to you. So we're asking that you would just pour out on us and help us to focus upon the things that are important to release those things Lord Jesus that are behind us and to move on in your direction that you would help us to be ministers first in our own house servants to our families to love one another Lord Jesus and to love you by fulfilling your commandments you would pour out your wisdom, Lord Jesus, upon us. For we do not know how to live in this day.
direct our paths and order our steps. And that whatever comes next, Lord Jesus, we will have already decided that we're going to go through. Before it ever comes, Lord, we will have already made that decision. Just as you did in Gethsemane. Single-minded of purpose. Single in eye, single in heart. Tear down the walls, Lord Jesus, in our hearts that divide us into two. We cannot live as two, Lord. We must live as one. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be the same person outside these walls as we are inside these walls. That we would be made whole, Lord Jesus, perfected in you, Lord.
Younglings, those that want to be baptized today, can you come up here so I can pray with you? Thank you, Jesus. Before we move into this baptismal service, is there anyone who needs prayer this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone who needs prayer and needs the Lord to move in some, in some way this morning? Thank you, Jesus. the name.
Paisley, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin.
keep these little ones in prayer this week. Also, don't forget Bible study Wednesday night at 630. And next Saturday, our church picnic. Woo! Woo! 11 a.m. until. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed week in Jesus' name.